Well, good morning. It's uh, certainly good to see so many people out on a dreary morning. I uh, appreciate the hymns that were read by Brother Mal- led by Brother Malloy. And uh, I also want to say that I appreciate the opportunity to speak here while Stephen is gone. There's, I think, a very long list of men much more qualified than I am to stand in front of you, but hopefully I won't disappoint. In the scripture reading that was read for us out of Acts chapter 2, it serves as a a preface to what we're going to talk about this morning uh, in that sermon that Peter gave on the day of Pentecost when he convicted the Jews of, of their sin, of rejecting the Christ and crucifying him. And they were, they were cut to the heart in verse 37. And they asked what they should do. So Peter told them uh, what they needed to do in verse 38. And we often look at that uh, to illustrate the importance of baptism, the role of baptism, and appropriately so. But today I want to look at uh, the first part of that verse. Uh, the simple command, just one word, to repent. Repent. So uh, repentance, we often uh, mention it as one of the the steps of salvation. We need to hear the word, to believe it, to repent of our sins, confess Christ and be baptized for the remission of our sins. And this morning I've broken up uh, repentance into three steps uh, to illustrate maybe some of the pitfalls that we have uh, in truly repenting from our sins. So we know that... um, It's necessary for a sinner to come to Christ. Uh, They need to repent. And also for those of us who already are Christians, we live in a world corrupted by sin, and sometimes we fall into sin ourselves. We need to know how to deal with that. Uh, The steps I've broken this into are, first, we need to acknowledge our sin. We need to stop doing what's wrong. We need need to amend our lives. We need to begin to do what is right. So first, I want to define our terms, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of these, these words, so bear with me, uh, but the basic definition of biblical repentance is a change of mind, it comes from the Greek word uh, metano eo, or that's the word that's translated, I should say, uh, which is defined as to think differently or afterwards, to reconsider, uh, to change one's mind or purpose. Now, uh, I should also point out that this is not simply the feeling of regret or sorrow. Uh, There's actually a different Greek word, uh, metamelomei, excuse me, um, that is translated as repent a few times in the King James Version, at least, uh, but it's not truly used in the sense of repenting of our sins. It really is just the emotion of sorrow But with repentance, there's a lot more involved. So first, to truly repent, we need to acknowledge our sins. Uh, The scriptures are full of people who are in sin and they're confronted by it, but the vast majority just don't listen to it, right? We can see this, um, some large examples would be in the case of Noah, who preached to his generation for so many years while building the ark, and only eight souls were saved, himself included. When you think of how many thousands or millions of people uh, wouldn't listen to uh, their sins being condemned and wouldn't change. Think of Jeremiah, who preached to the kingdom of Judah for so long, trying in vain to uh, get them to change their course, to go back to God. And I think uh, so often the response to being told that we're in sin is simply to try to justify ourselves. And we see this throughout the Bible. And when you go back to to Genesis, uh, to the first sin committed by Adam and Eve, in Genesis 3.12, when uh, Adam is confronted by God, well, Adam and Eve both are, and they're asked, what did you do? Adam says, well, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me an I ate, Right? It's not, it's not really my fault. And in the same vein, when God turns to Eve, she says, well, the serpent deceived me, right? I, wasn't, I shouldn't be held accountable, in other words. I'm excused from this. We see this also uh, in the case of Aaron, 
in Exodus 32, when the children of Israel cried out for a God and he made them a calf of, of gold. And Moses is right, righteously angry at him. He said, you know the people, that they are set on evil. I, I just couldn't help it, in other words. And we'll also look at the example of Saul. In 1 Samuel 15, if you'll turn over there. In 1 Samuel 15, Saul is told to go and destroy the Amalekites, to leave none alive, to kill all of the animals. But we see he ends up sparing King Agag and the best of the livestock. And I'll start reading in verse 20. And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So we see that initially when Saul is confronted by Samuel, he tries to even deny that he did anything wrong. He obeyed the voice of the Lord, you know, except in this one little area, right? And then when Samuel uh, convicts him, rightfully so, then he eventually does kind of, okay, confess, yeah, I sinned, but I feared the people, right? So in all these cases, we try to minimize uh, the amount of wrong that we've done, right? We try to, to pass the blame off at least somewhat, as much as we can, onto other people. But that's not how we repent. Uh, instead, we see the righteous will acknowledge their sins. Uh, we see this, I think, best illustrated in the case of King David. Uh, after he sinned with Bathsheba by committing adultery, he murdered her husband to try to cover it up. Then Nathan the prophet comes to him and he makes David realize the gravity of what he's done. David doesn't say, well, it's Bathsheba's fault, right? She shouldn't have been in a situation where, you know, I would have seen her. She shouldn't have come to me when I called for her. He doesn't say any of that. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. In Psalm 51, which he writes about the same incident, he wrote, for I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. This is what we have to do uh, if we're to, to obtain uh, true forgiveness. We have to realize that we've sinned. And this is kind of a hard thing to do, to accept. Because accepting responsibility for our sin means accepting shame. And we seem to have a, a strong aversion to anything that makes us feel uncomfortable uh, to feel like we've done something wrong. And it just requires a lot of moral courage to simply say, I have sinned. But until we do, we get further and further away from God. Simply recognize that, that you have sinned. Once we've done that, we need to realize and stop doing what is wrong. Uh, sometimes when we're confronted by sin, we end up sinning even more. We try to block out our, our shame and our guilt. And it ends up just causing a, a downward spiral of guilt, heaping sin upon sin. And we, we can stop at any time, but the, the, the longer we wait, the harder it is. In the scriptures we see uh, in Acts chapter 7, if you'll turn over there with me. We see when Stephen preaches to uh, a crowd of Jews, condemning them for what they've done to Christ and the prophets. 
He ends it, uh, starting in verse 51, by saying, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Skipping down to verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. When they were convicted of their sin, instead of uh, acknowledging that, uh, putting their sin away, Notice that it says they stopped their ears. They didn't want to listen to the condemnation anymore, and they killed the messenger. We see also in the example of Felix, uh, in Acts chapter 24, after Paul gives his defense uh, before Felix after being imprisoned by the Romans, then Felix sends for him, Picking up in Acts 24, verse 24. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Notice that it said Felix became afraid. I mean, why did he become afraid? Well, I think it's, it's fair to say that Felix realized that he was in sin. Uh, and when Paul preached about the judgment, he realized he would be judged. But he didn't want to change. He didn't want to give up the life of sin that he'd lived. And for him, that was just too much of a price to pay. And so he added to his sins by, uh, by putting off his obedience to the gospel and leaving Paul bound uh, indefinitely. But once we do uh, stop doing what's wrong, start doing what's right, or we need to, to amend our lives to do what's right. And I think at this point, sometimes there's this temptation to just give up, right? If we've uh, committed sins, we realize we're a sinner, then sometimes we just get so discouraged uh, and are so discouraged that we, we don't think we can move on, right? We, it's good to feel guilt over our sin, but sometimes we're just crushed by it. Uh, I think a great example of this would be Judas, Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 3. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Judas was simply so crushed by by guilt, I think, that he took his own life. Now, Judas was not, I believe, was not beyond um, forgiveness. That he couldn't have been forgiven, I should say. But he didn't, didn't seek to amend his life, to truly seek forgiveness. And I think sometimes uh, we, see, we feel like we're almost supposed to give up. Uh, I think one example of this is, is Cain. In the book of Genesis, after uh, after he his sacrifice was not pleasing to God, unlike his brother Abel's, then Cain became angry. And starting in verse six of Genesis four, so the Lord said to Cain, "Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you." but you should rule over it. God doesn't tell Cain here 
that he's supposed to give up, but that he's a failure. He says, sin lies at the door. In other words, there's a temptation to sin even more. But you should rule over it. You have the ability to control it, to control your, your future now. So God tells him to get his life right. Now we know that, that Cain ultimately didn't do this. He continued down the path of sin. He killed his brother, the first murder recorded in the Bible. But we contrast this idea with Paul. Uh, we know before he became a Christian, we won't take the time to read these verses, but he persecuted the church unto death. He made havoc of the church. Uh, he was, even after becoming a Christian, people were a little bit uncomfortable with accepting him because they weren't sure, well, is he really trying to, trying to kill us? And it would have been so easy to give up. I know if I were in his position, if I realized that I'd been persecuting the truth that I thought I was protecting. It would feel like my life was a failure. But that's not what Paul's attitude was. When uh, he realized, or excuse me, instead of that, he's able to put the past behind him. In Philippians 3, uh, I won't take the time to read this, but we need to be able to, like Paul did say that we've um, forgotten the things which are behind and look forward to what is ahead, to press toward the goal of um, the goal of serving God and put the past behind us. So in conclusion, we've looked at how we need to acknowledge our sins. We need to stop doing what's wrong and amend our lives to begin to serve God. If you're in sin, it's not too late to repent, to make your life right. But the longer that you wait to do that, the longer you stay in sin, the harder it is. Please don't wait. We're, we're here for you. If you aren't a Christian and you need to become one, we can help you be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you are a Christian and you've fallen back into sin, either you need the prayers of the congregation or to confess your sins, we're here for you as well. But please don't wait. Whatever your need, please come forward now as together we stand and sing.